On today's episode of Locked On Mets, we have another Friday Farm Report as we are going through the top 20 prospects in the Mets system. I'm once again joined by Jordan Grossman, our social media coordinator, as we are going through our collective top 20 list. This week, we are at number 10 through number 6, talking about prospects like Jalen Palmer and JT Ginn, amongst others. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein. Ryan you can also find some of my writing about the Mets at JustBaseball.com, where I am the managing editor. All right, so let's get after it today. Top 20 prospects here with Locked On Mets. <laughs> Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back with another Friday Farm Report. Jordan Grossman and I are going through our top 20 Mets prospects over the past couple weeks here. We have now got to the top 10. So today we're going 10 through 6. And unlike some of the previous episodes here, our lists are starting to align. As you get closer to the top, uh, it's pretty clear that you know the Mets have prospects that are pretty widely regarded as the top 10 here. There's only one difference between our two top 10s. Uh, you had uh, Jalen Palmer at 11 last week. I had Palmer at 9. And you have Joel Diaz in the top 10. I can't remember how far. I think I had him at 17, if I'm not mistaken. But the more we talked about him a couple weeks ago, the more I'm thinking that I'm still a little low on Joel Diaz. So let's just bring him up again. Uh, what made you include him in the top 10? He, he's still, what, 17, right? 17, 18? He's 17 or he's about to turn 18. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and so, so I, I, there's as we talked about last time, there's a chance this is the the highest ceiling arm in this farm system outside of Matt Allen. Absolutely, yeah, I think that's without question for me. Um, he just he has something. I I talked about it the other week when we first brought him up. He has something that a lot of 17 year olds, 18 year olds don't have, which is above average control, which is just it's such an important part of. Uh, your development as a pitcher and you know, to have it at such a young age, it's extremely important and it's an extremely good sign. Um, he already has a really good fastball can go 95, 96. Um, and it's that, that velocity is probably going to continue to grow as he matures, you know, grows into his body a little bit, add some strength. Um, he just put up, he put up ridiculous numbers. I know it's Dominican summer league, but like 15 starts um, had a 0 0.54 ERA. 1.6 walks per nine, 11.3 K per nine. Like he was just, he was blowing guys away in the Dominican. He just looked way above um, anybody there. He was just, he, he looked like he, he belongs stateside. And that's where he's very likely going to be at this, at the start of the minor league season. So we're thinking like low a probably at this point. I think he's probably going to start an extended spring training and eventually yeah. make his way to low a. That's probably the plan that the Mets have in place for him. Um, but if he really blows people away in the like you know the first few weeks of minor league camp, I I'm assuming he's there right now. Um, if he just blows the the, the coaches away, I, there's a chance he maybe he even starts the year in low A. What's crazy about that again? As you said with the with the control paired with the stuff, you know sometimes it's one or the other, especially at that age. So the fact that he has that chance with the you know really high level stuff, the high velocity, the fact that he's already showing the control. Those are the prospects that we could see at a young age. I mean, the fact that he's already just 17, uh, you know, this could be a pitch. Like if I said right now, 21st birthday, j this is way too early. So much left to prove, but just, just based on your gut reaction from watching, if I said, will he be here before his 21st birthday? What, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, if he continues on the path that he's on right now, I, I don't think it's that crazy to say something like that. You know, he's the main thing right now for him. The biggest issue is the development of a third pitch. He has a really good fastball. Like I said, and the changeup too is above average. Um, he has a curveball that he's trying to work in a little bit, doesn't use it too much. So he's trying to develop that pitch. I'm sure the Mets will work with him on a slider eventually. Um, so yeah, the, the development of those pitches is going to be key as he moves up the system to see if he can make it to the big leagues by, you said like by that 21st birthday, which would be a huge, 
that, that, that would be a huge story for the Mets just to get that guy up so early. You know, a lot of pitchers we see 22, 23, 24 at the earliest, you know, getting him up here at 21 would be a big deal. I'm trying to think of the last time that we did see a Met up that young. I mean, you know, a lot of these guys, I was trying to think, was Matt's maybe the youngest one that came up with that group and he was maybe 22, something like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Like those, those. He's like basically you're considering him a high school arm, because he's because he's seventeen, eighteen. Yeah. Um, and you you just those guys spend at least four years, um, in the minor league system. Usually, you know, the a lot of organizations take their time with the pitchers. Yeah, and that, as they should. And that brings us to another pitcher who was added to the forty, uh, Jose Buto. I have him at ten. You have him at nine. So obviously, we're we're pretty much uh, on the same page with Buto. Uh, you know, where do you see him in the organizational hierarchy this season as, as we go in, like still below Adam Mahler, but in that mix to maybe get some starts this year? Yeah, he's like right below an Aller just because Aller has the age on him. Um, neither of them really have any experience, but I think Aller just, you know, proved it a little, a little bit more at the upper levels while Buto spent the first two months of the season in high A. So um, if he goes to Binghamton, um, at the start of the season, he's just really blowing guys away um, with that changeup. Like I, I know I've talked about it before, it's his best pitch. It's one of the best pitches in the Mets system. Um, it's got really, really great um, break on it. So if he's if he's really just using that pitch, they, they might use him in a reliever role to start, just because his he doesn't really have much of a third pitch. It's really he's really a two pitch guy. Um, so then maybe he ends up in a reliever role just to start out, and then eventually moves his way into into the starting rotation. Uh, if there's an injury or something like that. But yeah, he's absolutely a guy you could see ma- having some major league appearances in July, August, September of this year. Yeah, and I think there's definitely uh, nothing wrong with getting some more relievers in the pipeline. It's actually, uh, of all things, I saw Jack Ramsey's, uh, o- was it OTP? Is that what they call it? OTT? Yeah. Yeah, the sim- simulation. <laughs> yeah, the simulation. And uh, Tyler McGill through 70 games had like a 2.1 ERA or something out of the bullpen. And I was just thinking like, you know, is, is that maybe the move with someone like a McGill or, or some of these guys that have the velocity that because, you know, if you expect the Mets to, to sign a Zach Grinke or to make another trade for a starter or to sign uh, Kikuchi, it, it, if they're going to make another addition, they have a rotation set. Uh, you know, could we see some of these guys maybe be converted to relievers for this season to give them that some more depth in that department? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just a guy like a Buto, like Aller, um, trying like even if the Mets add another arm, you could put McGill in the bullpen for a little bit. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of other names. Josh Walker is a guy who's probably going to see some time in the majors because this year, um, he's another guy who's probably going to be a lefty out of the bullpen. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Th- those guys are incredibly valuable. I mean, we see every year, like the last couple of years, the Mets bullpen needs to be a huge point of emphasis for them. And to have those guys in the minor league system is is important. Yeah, no, it is, especially uh, if they don't add more to the pen, which I think we both assume that they're going to add at least an arm, if not two, to replace Aaron Lube. And, and, and Andrew Chafin. Yeah, it's got to be Chafin. Chafin's, Chafin's my guy, too, at this point. Although, you know, I would not be opposed. Uh, Steve Cohen just wants to keep spending. You know, I was doing uh, the top five uh, remaining relievers for uh, just baseball a couple weeks ago. And that guy, Kenley Jansen, is still really good. <laughs> you know what? Oh, yeah. And, and it, to me, when I look at the bats, uh, it would not be the worst in the world to get the guy who's saved more games than anyone in the past decade and, uh, you know, bump Diaz from the closer role. I don't know. It's it it's something that actually, if it, if you're really trying to win now, kind of makes a little bit of sense too. Oh yeah, they they need all the relievers they can get. And, you know, a guy like Jansen's obviously very proven. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, what would you right now? If I said uh, you could have one signing, uh, you add a huge bat in Chris Bryant, or you sign Jansen and Chafin. I'd rather go Jansen and Chafin. Same, yeah. Same. Just because I think they, they they need the relief help, and I think the lineup is a little bit better than people think. Like, I obviously want still want to add a bat, but it's not like a huge, huge need. They definitely need to, um, you know, side more with the pitching in terms of free agent additions. So, I in that situation, I would 100% go with Jansen. Yeah, we're, we're on the same page for sure. This is the time of year where in the past I might have given up on my New Year's resolution to eat healthy, but I'm sticking to it this year because of Bilt Bar makes it so much easier to 
eat healthy because I actually enjoy eating them. These are protein bars that taste like candy bars. They also have the first ever protein infused marshmallow. That is their puffs, which are fluffy and marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar. They're a treat that comes covered in 100% real chocolate with incredible flavors like the cinnamon churro, which is just delightful. All built bars come covered in that 100% real chocolate as well, just like those puffs. And there's flavors like mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new this month, the white chocolate cookies and cream. They're all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. So if you check out built.com, you can see what's new. And when you're there, make sure you use the promo code LOCK15, and you're going to get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. Uh, now I've gotten sidetracked, so let me get back to the <laughs> prospects. Uh, you know, we got uh, Jalen Palmer before we get to the three that we are, are spot on with. Uh, you know, we talked about him last week, have him at 11. I have him at nine. Uh, you know, this is a, a really interesting camp. Did, did you, what did you see from him as uh, he did some interviews? To me, he looks like he might be in even better shape. Uh, the guy looks completely jacked. He's talking about being more comfortable playing the outfield. He said he's starting to welcome that more. And I do wonder if maybe the outfield does become more of a long-term home for him where that athleticism can really play up. Oh, yeah. I saw some pictures of him arriving in Port St. Louis the other day. He looks he looks like he put on some muscle. In the, in yeah. The, maybe, maybe he's working out Francisco Alvarez. I don't know what he was doing. Um, but, yeah, he really, he, he really bulked up. Um, which is always a good sign for a guy like that. You know, he was very, he was very thin his first couple of years. You know, he's, he's a high school, he was a high school kid, you know, 18, 19, and now he's starting to grow into his body a little bit more. Um, but yeah, playing the outfield would be, you know, he's an extremely versatile guy already. He plays second base, third base. He's played some shortstop has the, you know, has played all three outfield spots. So if he gets even more time in the outfield, I think, um, It'll only boost his chances of getting to the majors. Um, the strikeouts are a big issue for him right now. Still, he just he's swinging and missing a lot. Um, but he has good plate discipline. Hits the ball. Like I've mentioned it a bunch of times before. Hits the ball extremely, extremely hard. Like some of the best exit velocity numbers in the Mets system. Um, so yeah, he he's a guy who I'm really excited to see what he does. Um, getting a little more adjusted in Brooklyn this year. You know, I'm sure there's a little bit of nerves because it was it was a bit of a homecoming for him, being that he's from Brooklyn and having a lot of family there at every game. So. Hopefully, he settles in a little bit more and can show us what, what, what he can do in the in the in Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm planning on doing a little more traveling this year to the minor leagues, and that's a guy where uh, you know I want to to get out there early uh, to actually see him in Brooklyn because you know obviously I can go to Binghamton and see him whenever he he might get that call this year as well. But uh, I want to see him on that stage. I'm curious. You know, uh, are we're gonna see so, like a clear section of of a family and friend section for Jalen Palmer uh, at some of those games. Uh, I'm sure he's gonna be well represented out there. And I, I, we already talked about it last week. I think he's the unquestioned like star of that team heading into the year, based on being the local kid and based on his now top prospect status after the season he just had. Oh yeah, he's you know if he has a really good season, I could see him. And you know, assuming there's a couple of graduations um, in the system, he could end up being a guy who finishes the season as like a top six, seven guy in the system. It's crazy, and then, you know, it's it shows all the work he's done and uh, the performance he had this past year. Uh, this brings us to three prospects that we have the exact same ranking on uh, six through eight, all identical. We start with Khalil Lee, um, who we've, I mean, I feel like we've talked about Khalil Lee almost every other week here on our farm reports. He's been a, a common topic of discussion. As we look right now at the Mets outfield depth, the show I did today, I was talking about Michael Conforto and how, you know what? It makes a little bit of sense. You know, I, I want to ask you about that first. Uh <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm rocking my uh, my scooter in the big man shirt actually right now. So look at that. So there you go. Look at that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, scooter could come back here. Uh, I really do think that it actually makes more sense than I first gave it credit to because, you know, Mark Cannon can be the DH and, you know, spare Pete at first base a little bit, spare all those guys in the outfield. And I like Michael Conforto's fit long term next to Starling Marte a little more than Brandon Nemo's, not to mention. You know, on a long-term contract, isn't Conforto the safer bet here after what we've seen? You know, as Nemo still has yet to have a second season where he's played 100 games due to health. 
Honestly, at this point, you know, I've been a big Conforto fan ever since he got drafted. Um, but long term, I'd probably bet on Nimmo, honestly. Wow. Um, if Conforto wants to come back, I'd be happy to have him back on a one year, two year deal. Um, just a short term thing where he wants to rebuild his value. I think a lot of guys are going to end up taking like short term deals once this lockout's over just because they want to get on rosters. They need to start spring training. They don't want to haggle over extra years and stuff like that and have to end up signing in April or May. Um, so guys are, I think are going to sign very quickly on short term deals. Not everyone, obviously. You're still going to see a Carlos Correa probably get like an eight to 10 year deal. Those big names, uh, Chris Brown will probably still get a five, six year deal. Um, but yeah, if Conforto wants to come back on a one to two year deal, I'd be more than happy to welcome him back. I think he's still a really good player. Um, 2021 is not the kind of player he is. Um, I think he's a lot more towards the 2018, 2019 version. You know, that's the player that Michael Conforto is, a guy who hits like in the 260 range, can hit, you know, close to 30 homers, drive in 80 runs um, with a lot of walks and, and good power. Yeah, no, I think so too. I think for me, um, I think the question comes in on the one year deal is, uh, would having Conforto back in 2022 be worth giving up the, the pick that you're going to get if he signs elsewhere? That, that's the question. And I think it is, but I don't think the Mets would necessarily think the same way because, you know, if you're going to do that, why not just sign, say, Suzuki and keep the pick? It, you know, something mm-hmm. like that could come into play for sure with Conforto. But again, here I am on a prospect show getting away from prospects. So we'll get back to Khalil Lee. When it comes to the outfield depth, uh, you know, the, the notion of signing a Chris Bryant or a Michael Conforto or even, you know, like a Tommy Pham, I think that would be obviously because you don't trust the depth that you have. But I kind of think that going into the season, I'm not concerned about the outfield depth because the Mets have Khalil Lee, because right now you still have Dom and Jeff Hill that, that can play the outfield. So I look at their depth and I think that maybe they'll have to address it during season. But I think, you know, in the offseason now, I think that their outfield depth is perfectly fine. And Khalil Lee, being as close as he is, has a lot to do with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't mind adding a another out, major league outfielder to the 40-man roster. I have no problems with it. Um, like I just said, if Conforto wants to come back, I'd be more than happy. But, um, yeah, listen, Khalil Lee had a really good year in Syracuse. Um, there's a couple of things that are concerning. Obviously, you know, the – the high strikeouts, he struck out 29.6% of the time, which is not great. Uh, the BAPIP was above 400. So the, both of those things are a concern for him. Um, but also the thing that just really impressed me is the walk rate. He had the fourth best walk rate in AAA with a minimum of 150 plate appearances. It was at 18.3%, which would be you know elite if it was at the major league level. Um, so just for him to, for him to have that such good plate discipline in an age like that, is um it's a, re- it's a really good skill to have obviously and um if he can just grow into a little bit more power i think he's a guy who could you know eventually turn into a starter yeah i think that with khalil lee you know obviously the stats are so great in that league he led it in wrc plus and on base percentage that's i think his on base percentage like 460 or something like that by the end of the year so yeah. uh it, crazy numbers i think the question for me is going to be you know can he uh, if not get better at hitting the breaking ball, at least get better at identifying it. Because, I mean, I think it's pretty clear he's going to hit fastballs. Um, but if he can at least get himself to the point where he can identify those breaking balls, get into good counts, and kind of ambush those fastballs when he gets them, I think there is a chance that one day, um, you know, obviously required getting the playing time, he could hit 20 bombs in a big league season because uh, the power is there. It's just a matter of kind of tapping into it more in games. But I, I Khalil Lee is a prospect that I, I think, you know, assuming he's not part of one of these like, you know, pre pre agreed upon trade. I guess we were talking about that before the show started, how uh, these GMs could be talking right now, even though they're not supposed to be. If he's not like included in some Luis Castillo pack or something like that, if he's part of this organization during the season, to me, there's there's no doubt that he's going to play a pretty big role. I, we did this with Aller last week. I'm going to set an over under for you on games played for Khalil Lee. Uh, so if I set the over under at 55 and a half, or actually, we'll f- yeah, 40, 54 and a half. So will he play 55 games this season? What would you take there? I, I'd go under just because I think the Mets are going to add another outfielder. Um, yeah, I just, I, I mean, I think he'll play around like 30, 40 games. Um, the reason why I, I think that he might get there is simply because I could see him because because the Mets are going to be great, right? So I, I could see a scenario 
where we get a lot of uh, blowouts and little late inning replacements for Khalil Lee coming in for defense. Just, That's just, true. You know, you know Starling Marte is already three for four. You're up like ten to ten to two. You know, take Marte out. He's thirty three years old. And put mm-hmm. Khalil Lee out there to run down some fly ball. So uh, that would be how I would think he might get a lot of games played. But yeah, I think overall, um, you're right. The the role could still be a little bit limited, uh, especially mm-hmm. if the Mets do make more additions here. Oh yeah, if they make an addition, and also I think. Nick Plummer and Jake Mangum are right on his tail. That's true um, too. You know, yeah. you know, has clearly has a higher ceiling than those guys, but they're but they can both contribute. I think Mangum and, and Plummer at the major league level right now, whereas Lee probably still needs a little bit more time in AAA because of those things I mentioned about the bat pip and the, you know, the strikeouts and the you know developing power. So he's still going to need a little more time in the minor leagues, where I think the other two are just they could be ready to go right now. Um, Mangum's a guy I could see getting, you know, 50 games in the majors this year. It's, it's definitely possible. Um, so yeah, I just, I think I would go under there. I think yeah. eventually if, if we, if we're in July and the Mets need to make an addition, I think Lee's a, a, a prime trade candidate probably because he's gonna, you know, no one wants to spend two, three straight years in the AAA. Yeah. Um, so he's probably, they're probably going to want to send him to a team where he can get major league playing time and that development against the major league pitchers. Well, you know, I mean, we've talked enough that, uh, you know, my, my, my trade package to get a big fish starts with uh, Khalil Lee and Ronnie Mauricio. So uh, I definitely could see that happening for sure. Football might be over this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fire coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, so now getting into Alex Ramirez. Uh, You know, this is just a guy that I think I'm really thrilled to see what he does. I'm really excited to see what he's going to do this season. You know, I talked a lot about Alex Ramirez when I had Aram on uh, going through his top 10 mess prospects. And he was one of those prospects that just completely jumped out to, to Aram on video when, you know, he's not paying as close attention as we do to the Mets system. And then he's watching these guys and it's like, man, this has, this guy has the potential to be the Mets best prospect at some point um, in the not too distant future. That ceiling is, is there with this guy. Uh, what do you think about where Ramirez stands right now and, and what he has to show this season? Yeah, so the biggest thing for him is just um, it's always been about tools with him. Um, and it's still very, very early in his career. I think he's 18, 19 right now. Um, but if you look at the numbers on the surface, you know, obviously people are going to look and say, like, you know, he only hit 258. He slugged 384, 710 OPS in 76 games with St. Lucie. It's like those numbers aren't that impressive. But when you consider that he's such a young kid playing at low A, um, it's pretty stateside, impressive that he even... stayed side for the first time, too. I mean, that that's yep. a big distinction, too. Yeah. And it's, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, he's, you know, he's extremely far away from where, from where he lived, where he grew up. He's away from his family. Um, so, that, you know, at the beginning, it can be a little stressful for him and a little bit, you know, uncomfortable just trying to get used to his surroundings. Um, so, but like with him, the tools are just, they're absolutely incredible. When the biggest thing I heard is that when the sound off his bat, it's different than like almost anyone else in the Met system. It's like Francisco Alvarez level, like the, the sound of the bat, like he just, he has such a good swing. Um, when he, when, when he makes contact, um, he can, he can, he can destroy baseballs, um, and I think I think the biggest thing for him this year is gonna it's gonna be like the same issue as Ronnie Mauricio. It's just working on the plate discipline a little bit, making sure he's not chasing balls out of the zone, um, and just showing a little bit more pop. Um, you know, I talked about like just now that power, but like he needs to show it a little bit more going forward. He's I think he's gonna end up back in St. Lucie to start the year. Um, I'd be surprised if he was in Brooklyn, um, but he's just yeah he's probably next to Alvarez, and um, he's probably the most high ceiling hitter in the Mets system right now. Yeah. I mean, I think that especially at his age, it makes sense for him to maybe even spend the whole year in St. Lucie. You don't have to rush him. I mean, you, you know, he can still, I mean, what is he again? He's 18. So maybe just turned 19. Uh, let me check for you. Yeah. So he, he turned 19 uh, last month. 
So there you go. So, I mean, 19 years old, he could spend this whole season, his age 19 season in low A, and then, you know, maybe get fast tracked the next year. I wouldn't even think that would be the, the worst thing in the world to keep him where he spent last year, where he might now be a little bit more comfortable um, and just work on development. Obviously, we know that the Mets have great technology everywhere now, but particularly in Port St. Lucie. I mean, that is their main hub there. So I think it might be the perfect place to develop him and let him spend the, in the entire season, take your time with him. Um, and, you know, I think we, we've already heard that in camp right now, um, speaking of the technology, like there's iPads everywhere. And, uh, you know, they're tracking these guys swing. So I, I just... I look at Alex Ramirez as, as this prospect that it's like he, he is going to be the the first example or one of the first examples of having one of these really high ceiling prospects getting developed completely by this regime. And I think that's really an exciting prospect here where, you know, who knows where, where he ends up going. But if the Mets are going to start developing guys like the Dodgers do, I mean, the, the, the ceiling is, is so high when it comes to Ramirez. Oh yeah, and you, have you seen this guy's swag? Have you seen the chains yeah. that he pulled up to in Port St. Lucie? He has the twenty-five, the Ramirez gold chain. It's, it's, it, it's pretty cool. It's you know, it's like a. I, I know people don't want to hear it, but it's like a Cespedes kind of vibe, where like he just has he has all the swag in the world. I'm telling you, it's kind of like in uh, in Moneyball where they're talking about prospects and like, yeah, that guy's got an ugly girlfriend. And like, what's that to do? <laughs> ugly girlfriend means he has no confidence. You you want to see these guys with some swag or with some confidence that that. That maybe shows they'll be ready for the bright lights. Um, we now have gotten to uh, the headlining prospect of the day, JT Ginn. Uh, we've talked about him a bunch on this show as well. Um, where do we think he's going to start this year? And, you know, how, how high could he potentially climb this season as he is, you know, the, maybe the highest floor pitching prospect the Mets have that, hopefully we'll be factoring into the rotation at some point in uh, the not too distant future here. Yeah. So I don't know how much more room he has to rise in the system, just because I think that top five there, you know, a very clear step above everyone else in the system right now. Yeah. Uh, even Matt Allen, who's just, you know, we're going to talk about next week, but he's even with him out, Tommy John, unfortunately he had to have the, uh, ulnar tr nerve transposition surgery too. I hope he, you know, I hope I hope he's throwing soon and back on a mound, but he still has a much higher ceiling than, than JT Ginn. I think Ginn is probably like at at his best, he's like a Marcus Stroman type. He's a number three um, who gets a ton of ground balls. Um, when he's working well, the slider is getting a lot of batters out. Uh, the sinker, I think, you know, he produced a sixty-two percent ground ball rate last year in eighteen yeah. starts between St. Lucie and uh in Brooklyn. So just yeah, he's he's gonna be he's gonna he's gonna be a worm killer. That's that's, yeah. that's a that's a great term to call those guys. I've used it a ton for guys like Stroman, Peterson again. Um just the amount of ground balls he can get it's it's really impressive. So I, I don't know if he's gonna get to like you know 10, 11 strikeouts per nine innings where it would really elevate him to a, a top of the line rotation starter. Uh, I don't really ever see him getting to that point. But um he's someone who could, you know, if he pitches well, um Throughout this year, I think he's someone who could potentially end up being in the Mets rotation at the start of 2023. That's and that's what they need right now with some of the question marks that they have um, on long term here of who's going to factor into the rotation. They need someone that can be, you know, consistent and solid. And I, I think that there is that potential here with with Ginn. I think that's why they drafted him, especially you know being advanced as he is. So it was good to see the season he had. Where did he finish up? He finished up in was it Double A? Double A, right? Um no he no he's he uh he was in high A. Oh no, he Brooklyn, spent, he right, spent right. the first first two months, you know, it was his That's first right. He, dom he dominated down low and then they brought it. and yeah. he was really good in high A as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah St. Yeah. Lucy St. Lucy was his first, you know, real pitching against uh you know, against guy major uh, against minor league guys since he had Tommy John surgery, so it was a bit of a rehab stint for him. And then you know, high A is where he was supposed to be. Uh, to start the year, and he finished out, I think, his last 10, 12 starts there. And uh, he, he pitched really well. So and, I think he, he he's a guy who's going to be Binghamton's top starter to enter this year. And like I said, if he pitches well enough, you know, he could be in Syracuse to start next year or maybe even the Mets rotation. Yeah, I, I mean, who knows if he'll, uh, if he'll get that that nod to just be advanced right to double A to start the year if they, you know, make them, you know, go five more starts or something in Brooklyn. I think we could see that as well. But, uh, yeah, I think – 
Double A is definitely going to be where he'll spend the majority of this season. And I would not be surprised if he also potentially got some time in Syracuse this year as well, if he pitched really well in Binghamton. So he is a prospect we're really excited about. But there's five more next week that uh, are something that, you know, obviously we've talked about all of them. We've talked about Alvarez. We've talked about Beatty. But some of them are talking crazy so far in camp. So it's going to be good to uh, discuss what has been said and uh, envision what the season is for the best prospects in the Mets system. As always, thank you for joining me, Jordan. You can find him on Twitter at MetsFansense02. Find his work with us on social media at Locked on Mets. Find his Mets page, we are or Mets Facebook page, We Are Mets Believers as well. And again, next week, he'll be back for our top five Mets prospects. All right, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. Hope you all have a great weekend. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now, for your second listen, check out Locked On Bets, hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. Locked On Bets is where you want to go for all your daily gambling needs. You can follow Locked On Bets wherever you get podcasts.